Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again on the podcast. We want to talk about group size and why group size matters. So to be clear, we're a bunch of facilitators and facilitative leadership is a thing in the world. More and more leaders are by necessity and by the joy of creativity needing to lean into ways of having groups interact intentionally so that we can have, uh, you know, co-creative ideas come forward in ways we didn't expect, because that's what we need in this era, this era of creativity and really complex, gnarly problems to dig into. So we're talking about group size specifically in this episode for um, sessions that you would have, you know, like when you bring people together to do a thing. Now, there's lots of other applications of group size, and there's probably going to be another episode for different uh for different, for different um, lens on group size, but this one is just about sessions. So, hey, Fran. Hey, Susan. Hey, hey Lisa. Hey. hey. So we're going to just start with the toss-up question of like, what's your favorite group size and why? <laughs> I'll start. And I think um, I want to answer it two ways. First, for a virtual session. Um, ideal group size in a virtual session is somewhere around 12 to 16. Uh, I love the uh, sensation of having a gallery view with um, a plethora of humans and knowing that through the power of technology and the Wizard of Ozing in the back room, uh, creating the different edges for the different sizes of groups um, is limitless. So that's in virtual. And I think I'm going to go with the similar in real life. Like my mind just keeps on going to the circle and um, somewhere around maybe eight to 12 in a circle uh, feels great for me. And again, that's because there's the potential there to um, create the different sizes depending on what we're trying to uh, enable and yeah I w wasn't expecting to say that but I think that the potential that exists in slightly larger groups um, using the techniques and tools that we have feels like my favorite group sizes what about you Fran mm. yeah hard to choose but I think actually one of my favorite group sizes is sort of between three and five and I think it's because I'm someone who really likes like getting into action and doing sort of more like work sessiony kind of things. Of course, like I love facilitating events and all these kind of things, but um, I find it really interesting when you're sort of between three and five, how you can really get shit done in a way that I feel like isn't possible uh, once it gets bigger. And that's often something like where I find myself also quite relieved when I find myself in a, in a group that size of like, oh, great, we're going to really be able to get into detail and sometimes hold a certain type of complexity that you can't when the group is larger that I really enjoy. But yeah, that's just my personal preference, I think. Yeah, you know, I I have a totally different answer for this from listening to the two of you. This is like really fascinating to me already because I didn't expect to to say that my favorite group size is like a thousand <laughs> no, or two like though like i really go to the to the extremes on this i just realized like i love a huge group for the potential of of moving a big swath of humanity all at one time and like and uh and so often the i mean obviously there's not a lot of like super intense interaction that can happen necessarily. I mean, but when you've got the entire group at, of a thousand people at one time, there's something really breathless and precious about being able to one way deliver messages that, that can shift things. And I have pre previously sort of underscored I mean, or, or not underscore, I previously sort of was like an underplayed this size thinking, oh, you know, if it's that big a size, just, you know, record a video and send it out. But now I'm realizing like that, like the preciousness of being in person when we choose to be in person, when it really matters is really a cool thing at that size. And then on the other side of the spectrum too, like a pair is my fave. Absolutely my favorite. I think that 
so much can happen in a pair because people, well, first of all, everyone's going to talk in a pair. I mean, that's just, that's sort of a given. Someone, someone will say something if they're in a pair. And, um, and I think it's a beautiful size for, for people to be vulnerable with each other. And of course that can happen in bigger sizes too, but it's, um, it's really precious in a pair. Isn't that interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm loving the variety of our three answers and actually, and actually that, um, that we're saying that they're, these answers are coming in the moment. And I think that's an important thing about these sessions. But let's just go to the to the intention question. Like, what is what is your intention when you are creating a session? Let's say, let's say you're the leader, or you're the sponsor, or you're the director of the group, or something that wants to pull people together to do work together. And um, and what what we just did here was really a, a generative conversation. At least it was, or generative sharing, maybe maybe not so much of a conversation, but a sharing. And the triad is a really beautiful size for that. So, I mean, let's go to like the leader's intention when they pull someone together or a group together. Yeah, well, can you say more, Lisa, in terms of the leader's intention? Like, yeah. are you talking about how do we find the right group size for the intention that the leader yeah, has? Even, yeah, even before. Yeah, even before group size, I think that we have this sort of default that, um, you know, sort of collaboration is the rage and participation is everything and we everything needs to be a participatory process and, you know, maybe so and maybe not. Um, but the idea of the leader being really clear of why they want to pull people together in a participatory process, that's what I wanted us to talk about and like and how that matters to how the entire session gets uh, framed up and conducted. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to also not necessarily focus on the word leader here. Um, mm -hmm. I would probably call it host, <laughs> like, yeah. or the, the caller, right? The person who mm -hmm. said, hey, we are, we are meeting for a purpose. Um, and it actually reminds me a bit of Priya, Priya Parker, that's her name, right? Who wrote that very good book about the art of gathering. I think she puts it into words really well around how important it is that the purpose of why people are coming together is to actually figure out what is the right configuration that I want to be working in. So yeah, I think it's almost like uh, thinking about the intention, but also where are we hoping to arrive and like how divergent and how convergent is that? Like for me, at least when I think about um, like session design, one of the first questions is usually like, how much is this about like generating lots of stuff versus building something or prototyping or actually getting to a specific outcome. And then through that, that starts getting you a bit more a sense of like, what is the, what is the energy of this session? And from there, you can start thinking about the flow of the, the different group sizes. Yeah, what that what that brings up for me is, again, it all goes back to purpose and invitation. Are we coming together to have an experience, to have a peak experience of what it feels like to be in participatory process or practice so that we can uh, bring that back into our day-to-day -day configurations as teams or pairs or even individuals? Are we coming together um, explicitly to confirm ideas that already exist? Are we coming together to review something that has passed? And I think that, you know, most times when I think about sessions that I'm either calling or asked to facilitate, it is about bringing the group a little bit further along the path or the journey to start to kind of cohere. And again, I, I think that group size for that outcome can be quite large. I think that if we are trying to uh, 
build up or help to extract something from a leader, then smaller sizes are probably better. Um, but I think the beauty is with, with, I guess, the art and craft of facilitation, um, during the session, we can always use our liberating structures or beautiful constraints to create those smaller, more dynamic pods or, or sizes within the larger whole. Hmm. Yeah, it might also be useful just to mention for the audience, if anyone doesn't know what liberating structures are, that it's uh, a really incredible toolkit, one could say, of lots of different facilitation techniques that we at Greater Than use all the time. And many, many people are, are using them around the world. And they're really great for basically tapping into collective intelligence and uh, play really in an interesting way with group size. So mm -hmm. um, we'll definitely make sure to put the link also to that in the in the show notes so you can explore that further. Yeah. One of the things that I, um, before I discovered liberating structures as a repertoire, uh, always was uh, interesting for me to think about in my early facilitation practice is um, how we use group size to help individuals with different thinking preferences uh, mm -hmm. participate in a way in a way that feels great for them. So you know, creating the conditions even during a, a large scale facilitation for some individual reflection. And then as Lisa said, in pairs, um, because everybody gets to talk in pairs and then spreading it out like that. Um, you know, one of our favorite liberating structures is one, two, four, all, and that's designed specifically for, to meet those needs, right? So one is you in quiet reflection for yourself, thinking about a prompt or a question or a possibility, and then sharing that with one other human. And then coming together with another pair and saying, oh, isn't this interesting? We've all got different perspectives on this. Or, oh, isn't this interesting? There are patterns emerging here that we can start to see already in a very short span of time. And then listening to the, the groups of four come coming together and how quickly we can get everybody's voice how quickly everybody's voice can be heard in the room and how quickly we can create the field of um, patterns or collective sensing that would never happen in traditional brainstorming, right? Uh, when Stefan Morales and I were um, planning the last session of the Liberating Structure Studio, which is uh, an offering from the Greater Than Academy, um, our tagline was, brainstorming isn't enough and it was never enough because uh, just getting random ideas out on a whiteboard or on sticky notes is interesting, but it's not very sophisticated. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I got to say one, two, four, all is really the, uh, yeah, the, the, the magic, the magic potion that I feel like we all use all the time. And I can really recommend that a lot as a structure. Yeah, so you're talking about this sort of advanced dance step of one, two, four, all. And the basic steps are to even understand what the different group sizes are good at doing. Right. I'm talking about group size, I just want to be like really specific with people about what are the different kinds of group sizes we're thinking about. And so maybe then we can talk about what they're good for. So one group size, of course, is whole group. Everyone all together, however big that group is. Another group size is a small group, about seven people, you know, somewhere around there. There's a quad, four, or I guess you'd call it a quint, five. So there's a, a slightly smaller size than a small group. Triad, pair, and then by yourself, solo. And these are all different group sizes that have their own unique abilities um, to have wonderful things happen, but different things can happen in each of those group sizes than the others. So so what's whole group good for everyone? What do you think? I think gaining coherence, like having the 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 message being transmitted, if you will, to uh, a big group of people so that um, that coherence or that, I don't know, like there's there's something unmistakable 
sometimes, and I'll get to the sometimes in a second, of everybody hearing hearing the same message at the same time synchronously. Now, the tricky part about that is depending on what that message is, the meaning can be landing different for every individual or for a group of individuals. So even in that large broadcast size, taking the time again, maybe even to look at the person sitting next to you or <laughs> quickly in breakouts to say, okay, this is what I heard and this is what it means for me, I think is, is like this, again, this more sophisticated next step of ensuring um, because we can't help it, right? There's nothing fully objective in the world, even if it's a, 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 a set of data, right? We're all going to, be, because of our experience and our biases, uh, interpret something differently. So uh, large size, group size is good for that synchronous transmission of information, but I would always um, uh, see if we can make time for that just turning to the person next to you this is what i heard this is what i think it meant yeah i would also add that i think um at least coming from an environment where we're sort of defaulting to all types of smaller group sizes most of the time and i would say because full group time is so valuable right like you're you're using up so many people's time try to really minimize it but I've definitely realized that there's one thing also that it really is unreplaceable on, which is sort of a, like developing a shared identity or feeling of belonging or connection to something. It feels like something that just sort of emerges. It's like a feeling like the extreme is maybe, you know, if you're at a concert and there's thousands of people or you're at the soccer stadium, that there's this energy that gets created. And that I think you need to make sure you always do have some of those moments so the whole group can feel each other and feel like a group, like one thing. And in some cases, you don't need that. Maybe that's not even your interest, right? Maybe you don't need this group to feel like one group. But if you do, I think having that that full full space with everyone is, is quite important. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the... the um emotional or the morphogenetic field that gets created among people and how that is can be an incredibly big, powerful force in a big group. Yeah, that's cool. So what about the small group size, about seven-ish or so people? This is the one that Susan imagines, like eight to 12 people sitting around a circle, right? So maybe, maybe a little bit bigger than seven even, but something like that. Definitely less than a dozen, I would say, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think like that size is really good for sort of uh, real conversations that feel a bit more intimate. Like it doesn't feel like you're in a crowd and you have to perform. Like when you want to remove the performative elements that people might be having when they're talking. And so um, sense making, a term that we like to use a lot when people are sort of exploring something from many different angles that's complex and you might want to have a lot of different perspectives and opinions in the room to be able to yeah have a rich conversation not maybe get stuck um yeah I think that's that's one of the good purposes I could see for that size I think also it's it's a really good size for developmental work so individual developmental work because it's not so small that you are having to be in continual interplay like this two or two uh, duos or triads, but it is a space where you can actually practice yourself of, okay, am I actually listening to what's being expressed in the group or am I thinking of the next clever thing that I'm wanting to say? And really using that group size to do some of your more developmental inner work at the same time as um, you've got this spark of being able to play off each other because the size isn't too big that you can't do that. And there's enough um, diversity of thought in the room, generally speaking, that um, the potential of what can emerge is greater than it um, is sometimes with a smaller group or a larger group. And there's just enough space too. what you're saying, Susan, you're not, you're not in the smaller groups, you're more on you're going to be expected to talk more, right? And so there's just more space for you to notice yourself, notice how you're interacting, notice your reactions to things, but also just enough space to relax in case you don't have yeah. like a burning thing to contribute right now. Absolutely. You know, and that's, that's the lovely thing about it. And I think 
that this size group is is so beautiful for um, like a, what I think of, and I know this has been, this term has been used a lot, but when I think of a generative conversation, to me, a generative conversation is one where people say things they had no idea they were going to say, and they have no idea where those ideas are coming from. And so this is, this is the size group that I love to do like a meditation with at the beginning, or that we would have a slow conversation, a slow conversation, meaning that we don't necessarily have to respond to what someone just said. We can let the thing that the person said just be in the space. Um, and, and as we express in this really natural, organic, not hurried way, someone will say something and then, and then the whole room will go, oh my gosh, that is so, that's amazing. Right, it's just, you can feel that the, the idea catches everyone almost by surprise, and I think this is a beautiful size group to do that in. And I think probably could be done in smaller groups, but without as much variety and without as much possibility for that surprising idea to come up and to catch us all unaware. I think there's something about, and I, I use I always use this word guardedly. Um, safety i think just building on what you were saying earlier lisa that in, in, a, in a group that size you don't need to feel compelled to talk because um there is the room to just if you want to be in the listening mode to just just be in the energy of the group and not feel as Fran said like you have to perform or that your contribution necessarily needs to be to verbalize or vocalize everything you're seeing or hearing or feeling. And as we get to smaller sizes, then the the norm is to vocalize more. And so yeah. there's a little bit of a built-in pressure, which is useful, but but often could be misused, I imagine, as well. So I just mm. want to explore that with you all. So I don't really use the sizes of four or five very much. Do you all use the sizes of four or five? I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you got? I mean, the thing is like, uh, sometimes virtually when we do like a world cafe or, um, there's one called the pro the pro action cafe, which is more action focused. I would often find maybe groups of five. I find, especially online when you get above five, somehow the anonymousness feeling goes up way faster than in person somehow like seven in person to me feels more intimate than seven online. So yeah, I, I definitely find the five um, being a quite common one that, I, that I've that i used. Yeah, um, and I use fours a lot. I love quads because I love the, the ability to do pairs and then come together oh, and yeah. swap pairs and that I just, I really, really do get a lot of energy from, from, that, from that quad work because it gets into that uh, ability to have those edges. And um, I would say that I'm thinking of one particular client that I've been working with for years. And uh, I think that the, the, the great, great outcomes and great um, uh, action, moving forward action happens when we're working in quads um, and working in twos and then bringing it back to the center. Nice. You know, I'm just realizing there's one particular place I've used uh, a group of five four or five, um, it's a study hall vibe. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. basically each person is working on their own thing, but, and, um, but they're working on the same task, but it's their own version of that same task. It's a personal thing, but they're sitting together, um, kind of like you would see students around a table in the library or like, I guess students, you know, in, in Starbucks these days, right? Like sitting together. And so someone can per pop their head up and go, I'm having trouble like like really expressing this thing I want to express. And someone will go, I'll help you. <laughs> and then maybe there's a little com side conversation that happens and maybe someone else adds something else in, but it's basically like a, a, a support network. Um, and I I love that, that study hall vibe. Mm -hmm. It's not a possibility with that group, that, that group size that I think is too small if you get fewer people. And then if you get more, then it's really too diffuse to to keep people focused on the same task, but a personal version of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about the smaller sizes? Like what's the difference between 
triads and pairs in your mind? Like when would you use triads versus pairs, three versus two? Hmm. I mean, I think somehow they feel sometimes quite different to me um, because I guess like a triad could end up going as deep as a pair potentially, but like with a pair, there's a certain level of intimacy that that will be created much more quickly. And it really allows people to just fully drop in and open up. Like it feels like there's no limit to how much they might open up to the other person. And that with a triad, it just feels like that's a bit more capped, but that there's this really interesting dynamic of it's not just a ping pong, right? And that there is, it's, you can't quite call it resting because it's not like in the group of 12 where, you know, you can just decide to really listen but um, you can try these different dynamics of two people coaching each other and the other one then observing. And just in general, I feel like that there's, there's something about the flow of three, which we're all obviously also experimenting with in this show, <laughs> yeah. of, like how different perspectives can come together and how we can bounce ideas. And I find that the likelihood of getting stuck is much, much lower when you're three than when you're two. When you're two, you might end up in a like sort of a dead end with like, maybe there's a question and you're like, I don't know. And so to me, I, I just, I love the pair for anything that's more about, um, yeah, sharing like a personal journey or going more into anything that's related to our development, uh, personal growth, stories, where we want to have a lot of space basically to expand and, and show ourselves. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as um, in a different way um, than I was um, describing with the the groups of seven or above as a practice space, I think that triad is also a great developmental practice space um, because you do have that closeness, that um, intimacy around uh, being around practicing listening, around really uh, working and, and sensing into that collective potential together. I also love threes because it can work as a two, right? Especially as Fran, as you were saying, like as ongoing um, developmental trios, pods, triads, um, it, it it creates the opportunity again for if one person misses one time, it doesn't, the whole thing doesn't implode, right? So I think that the, again, the um, resilience of a trio, like the three-legged chair, I think is, is, um, is quite interesting to to play with as well. I love it. I, I also really think actually, <laughs> just, just to be nitpicky, technically speaking, I think we're only a group once we're three. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think that you're not actually a group otherwise and that there's something, there's a reason for that, right? That there's somehow um, more, more happening. <laughs> yeah, well, that's interesting. So my idea of a group being just solo is completely blown up in the air at this point. But I think it's something people don't think about very much is that you can intentionally design something for someone to work by themselves, for someone to have time to think, for someone to have space to breathe, you know? So I, I, I mean, think you're yeah. right. I don't, I don't think it's an official group size, Fram, but for facilitators, it's a, it's a tool. The solo, it's essential. solo it's essential. quote unquote group is a tool. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. And that was also not what I was meaning to, to, meaning to say with that. And like, cause also solo and pair is obviously also within a context of a group most of the time that we're talking about it like giving people time to work on something alone while they're in a, in a bigger event or session and then they come back, right? So it's like yeah. the, the solo time is connected to some kind of group time as well. Yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah, you're exactly right. And oh, there's something else, something else magical that happens, I think, in these smaller groups. Probably seven is maybe a little bit too big, but sort of getting down to the five and below of working um, using um, technology or using tools to work together, like the way that we oftentimes use um, Mural or Miro. Um, I can remember uh, the buzz, the jolt of um, like friction and just possibility that happened the first time I was working collaboratively with somebody at the same time on a Google Doc, right? It's like, oh, wow, like, this is amazing how we can be working together in real time, expressing our individuality on something collective. So I think that 
I do get very excited when I think about um, group size in relation to uh, technology and tools and, and co-creation as well. I, I, you know, I, I, the other thing that just came to mind when I was thinking about that was the way that we use uh, Easy Retro um, and the, the difference in the similarity of being able to uh, keep our, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like that social pressure down um, by using technology to um, uh, articulate our ideas without showing it to the group. Um, it's a harder to do in person, although it is, it is possible. Um, but yeah, just this, what's occurring to me is the group size and the possibility of even really leaning into this, uh, more, um, this space of openness and freedom from, uh, the pressure that we feel normally from the boss or the hippo or the person who's convening, um, this performance aspect to the work that we're doing in groups um, to be able to really collectively break that down. So like what's coming for me now is thinking about like, it's not just my role as the facilitator to create those conditions, but as we begin to practice, all of us collectively can start to become co-responsible for um, the conditions that we're creating being um, both both less friction and I guess more equitable and uh, freer of that social pressure. Hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. just because you mentioned it, Susan, um, easy retro for those mm. who um, maybe heard that. It's a, it's a tool for doing retrospectives online and it allows people basically to generate all their post-its and for the others to not see them and then you know, the great virtual facilitation power, then you can just uh, click a button and then everyone sees it. So mm. that's just to, to give some info on that. Yeah, or even the way that we use it quite frequently in chatter, Chatterfall in Zoom, right? How uh, have a prompt or a question and invite everybody to type their answer, but don't hit enter yet. And then they all come through at the same time. Uh, so many, you know, as as resist, as, as much as I crave in person, um, because it, it's just completely different. You can't even really compare the um, the virtual space and the live space in many ways. But there are some really subtle advantages to the to the virtual space that I I really love and appreciate. Sounds like another episode or two or three <laughs> about about virtual and async actually, because we haven't mm. really talked about that at all. And of course, you know, group size for async, also group size for an ongoing process. And how that changes across an ongoing process that's a whole other dimension to this that we can bring in probably in another episode let's wrap this one up i want to um like just do maybe a quick lightning round and then maybe hear some um warnings that you all have for uh for the facilitative hosts or conveners when they're wanting to bring people together Like the lightning round is, I want to give a scenario and have each of you say what's your favorite group size for that scenario and why, like quick, quick. And if you want, uh, you can pick up one of the other prompts and I'll answer with whoever the other person is, whatever, however it works. We'll, we'll just find out here together. All right, so I'll start first. So what group size would you choose for idea generation and why? I would probably um, do a combination of solo surfacing and then full group. That's my first reaction. Mm -hmm. My first reaction would be five to seven. Um, just because I think the diversity that, uh, from that number um, without going too far um, out of bounds is, is pretty generative. Um, what about you, Lisa? I was just, obviously each of us has a movie in our heads and I, <laughs> I have a movie in my head right now of actually a pretty large group of like about three dozen people, but they're at first they're in groups of five to seven. And then there's some way of harvesting from those groups. Um, you know, obviously the intention of the host really matters as to how you design this, but those are 
Um, but I, I was cool because as you were talking about your ideas, I could see a, a movie in my head of what you were talking about and it looked good. <laughs> so, so what about co-creation around a challenging issue? What would you do for that kind of session um, time? Yikes, around a challenging issue. Like I'm imagining something that has a little bit of conflict in it or a little bit of like um, difference that the group hasn't been able to process well yet. Um, there's something about convening the whole group and becoming clear about the facts, the who, what, why, when, but probably not the how. <laughs> Because that will be really debatable. Even who, what, why, and when will be somewhat debatable, right? Um, and then sending um, people into smaller groups. And if it's a really, really hot topic, I might teach people a skill of uh, venting, like how to successfully vent with each other and get the emotional charge out and like let them do that in pairs and then come back um, into maybe, um, fives. Yeah. So maybe Susan, I do use five more than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So and I, I don't know and why. Finally the whole group. And I don't know why for me, I just had five liberating structures pop in my mind around this, um, that can be used in, you know, ideally sort of groups of, uh, three to five, but then several of them. So, you know, several groups of three to five, you know, between 15 and 20 humans working on either like discovery action dialogue, which is about finding positive deviance in a group, um, doing the what, so what, now what, as Lisa was, was um, um, articulating, like taking the data that's causing the friction and figuring out if it's a misalignment of meaning that's potentially causing this or critical uncertainties, like wondering if it's actually the system that we're pushing up against as opposed to anything else, um, maybe in the relational field. Um, and all of those can be done really well with groups of um, sort of three to five people, but in in multiple um, pods of those sizes, and then coming back together and seeing where the similarities or differences is uh, differences are around um, the perceptions there. Um, Fran, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I was just imagining like a very a very prickly issue one where there's some some real elephants in the room, and I think. My default there actually would be maybe to send people into pairs first before they then come to the whole group, because I think sometimes allowing people to process a little bit and to actually a bit what you were saying, Lisa, of the venting, but just to actually say out loud to another person, the thing that maybe is on their heart or that is like that they're they're struggling with before then like to help them have the courage to say it to the group or to having heard from one other person like oh yeah I agree I also see it like that we really need to do something about this and that then it's more likely for you to not have like the sort of awkward silence potentially uh, and a challenging issue if you bring it to the whole group when you start hmm. but obviously there's so many different ways to do it and yeah. there's definitely no right way <laughs> yeah well, and I, I, mean, think what we're, I think what we're proving here is that there's not like a group size that is the quote unquote right or best for these. It's, we're talking about the combination of different group sizes to create basically a, a, a play that has a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, like this, this sort of arc of activity around a goal, in this case, dealing with a challenging issue. What are, what are some pro tips that we can give people or, or conversely some warnings, you know, when they're thinking about how, um, you know, the participatory processes and how to design things for um, the sessions that they're imagining hosting? Yeah, so I guess one thing that I really wanted to share, because I've been encountering this a lot, is that the concept or um, different frameworks around co-creation are very popular at the moment. So many people are talking about it. They're trying to do more co-creation and do things super participatory, but it's not always the right fit. And it's really important to actually be clear on which part of the problem I'm trying to solve or the thing I want to work on should be co-creative and which one actually not. 
And I think it actually takes quite a bit of work on the part of the host or the person who's inviting to really get clear with maybe a few other people that they need to, to work with on what are, the, what are the parts that we know, what are the parts that we don't. Because I think if not, sometimes you end up in what I would call these sort of fake co-creation sessions where actually the person who's hosting already has the answer. Like they have a vision of what they want to do. And they're sort of just trying to like do this fake session so that people feel like, oh, we came up with it or we, you know, we're able to like input when actually something's already defined. And that just feels like a huge waste of time and not fair. And yeah, it's just not a good use of co-creation, which has so many very, very good um, applications, especially when we're trying to be sort of more exploratory and we really don't know yet. So yeah, that would just be a big warning to me on figuring out when is the right moment to really use that. Hmm. And I, I would agree with that. And again, like so, so many things, if we're, if the, if the person who's the caller or hosting the session is transparent about that, it can still be really generative and really great, right? Like coming and saying, so this is the idea. It's sort of 90% formed. Um, these are the elements that aren't quite clear to me yet. And so I want you to feel um, confident that um, uh, I, I really do need help on, on getting clear myself on these um, and being able to express that it is uh, in service of somebody, in service of the vision of the caller uh, versus coming in with, I really have no idea about what to do here. And I think that um, the uh, collective intelligence of the group will help us see together what we need to do is completely different. Um, and, you know, it's just, <laughs> I, when you were sharing, Fran, I was thinking of, you know, the the huge critique that I've been carrying from my corporate days of um, consulting companies coming in. And because by law, for example, there needs to be a consultation period um, that is you know, in and of itself, everybody who's been around the block at least once knows is complete bullshit. Um, how much that still can uh, permeate even into cultures and progressive organizations that are trying to be more collaborative um, to really, you know, take a step back and be super clear on the intention and purpose of why uh, are we collaborating? Why are we hosting participatory process? Uh, what is it in aid of? And how much say or voice do you really have? And, you know, that comes down to, um, uh, I think would be really great for, an, uh, for, a, for a session moving forward on agreements and mandates and where decision-making lies. Um, because uh, if, we're, if we're being um, unclear uh, about how we're using these processes, it can just like anything do more harm than good. Yeah, I think that's my um, my double underscore on what both of you are saying is like my big fear is that words like participatory and co-creation become bad words because people have been stung by the fake, the fake mm -hmm. meeting where they thought they were going to actually get to express ideas, build on each other's ideas, come up with something new, only to find out that it was really just for the sake of um, getting their buy-in. It's one of my least favorite phrases, go and get people's buy-in. Yeah. Yeah. There's one more little piece that I had. And I, oh, this is it. I, I guess one little warning I would have for uh, the caller or the host is that any frame size is going to become nauseating. Any group size is likely to become nauseating if you keep people in it too long. <laughs> so, yeah. And just like be aware that variety, not variety for variety's sake, variety for a purpose can be really useful and be aware of when you've kept people in the same configuration for longer than it needs to be. Mm. Yeah, cool. that's a really great point to close with. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I guess we have I think more. We covered talk. a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a whole different angles on group size to talk about, but but this one I think we've got for now, huh? Yeah. Great yeah, time. Amazing. Thanks, everybody. See you again. Yeah, thanks for listening. Hope you can Bye. use this in your own contexts. Yep. Yeah. Bye.